Ah, it's time to chill out and get ready for a mediocre Q&A live stream. If you're old enough, grab yourself your favorite adult beverage. And if you're not, stick with apple juice. Put your feet up and relax. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. And now let's cue up the intro music. Yo, how are you guys doing this evening? Hopefully you're doing well as usual. Things are a little shaky this today. Like it kind of threw me off right now. Um, and you know what it is? I know exactly what it is. Is that I am drinking water tonight. Because I need to remember the show. And uh, I got to get back into this. Like I have this groove going and something was changed today. And it's like, oh yeah, that's why everything's kind of screwy right now. But Anyways, it's all good. I will get the hang of it one of these days. You know, it's only been like a, what, year and a half or something like that since I started doing these live streams. So, you know, one of these days I'll probably get it. Maybe two years or something like that. I don't know. But anyways, let's start this off right, okay? Um, intro myself. My name is Chris. Uh, I make these videos on YouTube. And I'm doing this just because there's so many new people in here, okay? Um, I make these videos on YouTube just to share the little bit of knowledge that I have, okay? Okay. Uh, I have some questions that I usually like to answer in these streams. I like to go over those questions. People email me, YouTube comments, Facebook comments, all that different stuff. And then just the standard uh, um, YouTube chat questions too. Uh, I usually like to cover the two videos that I most recently did. Um, and then I just kind of you know answer questions from the live chat, okay? Um, one of the questions that's going to segue into this whole introduction thing right now is someone had asked me how long I've been in the trade. I have not been in the trade that long. Okay. I did kind of grow up in the trade. I officially started working in April of 2002. So I think that makes it about 18 years if my math is correct, but my mouth is known to be completely wrong half the time. So someone can correct me if I said that wrong. Uh, I did grow up in the trade though. I started working for my father. Um, gosh, when I was really young, okay, working, holding his flashlight, sitting on his tool bucket. Um, I learned a lot from my dad, okay? I learned good things, bad things. Uh, you know, he was an old school service technician, and uh, there was definitely a lot that came from that, okay? Um, it made me the person that I am today. Not saying he was a bad person at all. Things were different in the past, okay? Uh, nowadays, our equipment is not as forgiving, and we have a lot tighter of tolerances when it comes to operation of our equipment so we got to make sure things are do you know working correctly so you know 
Um, but yeah, so I've uh, been in the trade for approximately 18 years, and uh, I just make these videos just to share the little bit of knowledge that I have, okay? Um, the last two videos that I released were on, uh, the first one was a, let's see, what do I have? I have it written right here. Uh, both ice machines are down. So it was two ice machines that were down. Okay. And then the second one that was released was the produce walk and was too warm. Um, guys in the chat, I'll look at the chat here in just a minute. I like to get through my spiel and then I'll start answering what's going on in there. Okay. I'm going to cover a couple quick questions with those two videos. Once we get through that, then we'll just kind of do a little bit more of the stuff I have in here and I'll address the chat and do all that. So um, one of the biggest questions I get is about manuals, okay? People are always asking me, where do I get the ice machine manuals? Um, I have a couple different manuals here, guys. Um, when I take training classes, this is the man, this is one of the Manitowoc books. There's some more sitting up there in the back corner. Um, here's a Follett ice machine book. You can see I didn't, I've only, it's been a long time since I've been to a full at seminar, 2016, 2017. I think I did one in 2018 too. Um, you know, this right here is a, uh, a Thermo Fisher scientific medical lab freezer book. The point that I'm trying to make is um, when I, let me try to address that. I don't know why the volume's low. Hold on just one second. Let's see. Um, Hmm, that's interesting. Let me move this cursor up a little bit. See, seriously, I've been having the weirdest volume issues lately. Let me know how that is, guys. I kind of turned it up just a little bit, so tell me how that would make. Um, see, that sounds really loud in my ears, so let me know in the chat, guys, if I'm clipping, okay? I don't think I'm clipping on my monitor, but sometimes you guys tell me something different, so... Um, but anyways, when it comes to the manuals, whenever I go to a training class, I never throw anything away, Okay. Um, I save every single manual out there and we'll see now I'm seeing someone saying the volume's fine cause I just turned it up. So hopefully it's not too loud, but okay. But I save every single manual that I come across guys. I don't get rid of manuals. Okay. When I go to training classes, I ask for extra manuals so I can hand them out to my service technicians. But when it comes with, when it comes to, you know, where do I get the new manuals? All you have to do, if you don't go to a training class, you can simply go to every manufacturer's website whether it be a Linux air conditioning package unit, whether it be a Linux residential air handler, whether, uh, you know, heat pump, whatever, um, go to their uh, websites, okay? All the manufacturers publish all this information. So when it comes to an ice machine book, go to manitowocice.com. You can download all their manuals, okay? If you want to purchase manuals, you need to reach out to your dealers, okay? So Manitowoc ice machines for me, I use Western Pacific distributors here in Cerritos, California. That's who distributes Manitowoc ice machines. So if I wanted to get a book from them, I'd go to them and say, hey, I want this service book. Oftentimes, they used to give them away for free, but I don't care. I'll pay for a book. I could care less, okay? Um, so you just got to do the research. You can find all that information, and I try not to ever get rid of those books, okay? Information is key when it comes to this stuff. The other thing you guys can do when it comes to working on any piece of equipment out there is just ask the Google, okay? Okay. Take a picture of a model and serial number, type it up on your phone. There's a lot of equipment out there that has apps and different things like that. Like Lennox has an app for their uh, commercial equipment, even the residential equipment, and you can download any other manuals on that app, okay? You just got to type some things in the Google search bar, and you could find so much information at your guys' fingertips, okay? We have the resources available to us. Um, the uh, Another question that I had on the ice machine video that I was... Uh, talking about the both ice machines down was I had a compressor bat on that one. Okay. But, um, I ended up replacing the compressor and Scott, one of my buddies had asked me, Hey, did you end up changing the T one or the T three and T four sensors? And no, I actually forgot to change those sensors. But a really important thing to understand when it comes to Manitowoc ice machines is the thermistors or the sensors, especially the T three and the T four sensor are the most common to go bad. Um, they do not affect the machine's operation. If you have a bad sensor, it just gives the machine bad information, but it doesn't do anything with that information other than raising an error code. Okay. The machine will not shut down because of a temperature sensor. Um, when the machines first came out with the Indigo machines, when they first came out, yes, they would shut down on an issue, but they quickly updated that because they realized that the temperature sensor failure rate was so high that they needed to make that disappear. So they did. Okay. 
Um, so, but yeah, next time I go there, I'll take care of that. Adam Neal, thank you very much for becoming a channel supporter. That is awesome. Okay. Um, let me see. Now, the next uh, video that I had was a produce walk-in that was too warm. That was a um, walk-in. That was actually the one I just released yesterday. Yeah, yesterday morning uh, before I went out with my family. Um, but uh, yeah, that that uh, video, uh, some of the questions that I had, one of the you know common questions I actually get quite often is because it was a high ambient temperature. Someone from Australia had asked me a question asking me, hey, how come we don't use misting devices on our condensers, okay? Um, because that particular condensing unit here in, that, that video was filmed a week ago, I think. So we're just in the beginning of May and it was over 100 degrees there, okay? So imagine once we hit full swing in August of summer, it's gonna get really hot, probably about 115 to 120 degrees there. Um, that uh, so why don't we use misting devices? Okay, misting devices are extremely hard on condensers. Okay, because of the mineral deposits left behind. Okay, we have very low humidity here in Southern California, so that water is going to almost instantly evaporate. And when it evaporates, it's not going to take the minerals with it. The minerals are going to be left behind as calcium deposits. They're going to get on the condenser. They're going to destroy the condenser. So whenever possible, we try not to use misting devices. Now. In some crazy summers, I think I have a few videos from a few years back where we had a crazy heat wave. That was the only thing that could keep my equipment operating because um, in that, that area that I filmed that video in was the desert, okay? So they get extreme highs. But in my area, I live more inland. In my area, we hit 120 degrees at my house. I think it was a year and a half ago. And that week that we hit 120 degrees, I must have done so many service calls where I was having to go reset pressure controls, replace pressure controls, because it was just so hot. And the way that we got through the summer was by adding misting devices to the equipment, okay? Zach, thank you very much for becoming a channel supporter. That's really awesome. Those of you that have done that, that's awesome. I don't expect it. I'm going to address that right now, too. I acknowledge my supporters. I probably don't acknowledge my channel supporters enough. There's several of you guys that have chosen to donate to my channel via Patreon, YouTube memberships, PayPal, all that different stuff. And I apologize. I'm not a very good host when it comes to that stuff. I am very grateful for the channel support that you guys give. That is amazing. Okay. It is not expected whatsoever though. All right. And I try to address it. But um, I, I really do appreciate it. But guys, I know we're going through crazy times right now, okay? And you're not going to hurt my feelings if you recall your channel support. If you recall, you know, if you don't make super chats, it's no big deal, okay? If you guys want to support the channel, there's other methods to do so too. Um, something as simple as just watching my YouTube videos. And I know this is the hardest thing in the world, but watch through the commercials, guys. I know it sucks, okay? Um, in some of my older videos, I used to listen to what YouTube said and I used to let them put the commercials in there. I don't do that anymore. Okay. Um, I only put one commercial in all my videos as of this point. Okay. Every once in a while, I think I, I might put two, but for the most part, I keep it to one commercial in the video. So if you can just simply watch that one commercial, you guys could support the channel and let YouTube pay me. Okay. That helps to support too. Um, there's another method too. If you guys are interested in purchasing tools, okay, and you happen to choose True Tech Tools as your website to purchase tools, you can use my offer code Big Picture one word, okay, Big Picture, and that helps to support me too. You get uh, eight percent off of your order. I get a small commission from it. There you go. You guys don't have to donate any of your personal money, and you get a tool that maybe you were thinking about, okay. But again, I brought that up because I wanted to acknowledge. I don't want to make people think that I'm trying to draw that in. I really do appreciate the support, but it's not needed if you can't do it. Okay. So I'm going to get off that topic and get back to my videos, uh, or get back to my things that I'm rambling on about. Okay. Um, so as far as the produce walk in too warm, you know, I had several leaks on the evaporative coil and I showed them in the video. There was a bunch of different micro leaks and I got a couple questions, you know, you could just braise that up. And I even addressed it in the video. Yes, I could have tried to braise up all those different refrigerant leaks, okay? The problem though is when you have that many refrigerant leaks, as many as I did, and you try to braise on those, um, that can be very difficult and it can just turn into Pandora's box. Okay. When you have that many leaks, that means that the copper is disintegrating from the inside or, you know, it's, it's very thin and something in the air is attacking the copper. And if you get in there with the torch, I'm sure I could braise some of the leaks, but I might create other leaks because if the copper is weak there, it's probably weak everywhere else throughout the coil. And as you start to heat it up and the copper expands, you can start creating other leaks and it just becomes Pandora's box. So you have to know when it's best to recommend to the customer, hey, it's probably not a good idea to fix any more of these. 
you know, and go from there. Give them the whole big picture idea, right? Um, again, almost done with this, and then I'll get to the chat. Um, another question, because I had mentioned Marcus. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I did see your email, Marcus. I, I, I will try to address that, okay? Um, thank you very much for that super chat, though, bud. That's awesome. Um, I think, Marcus, though, I'm trying to remember, with your email... I think you sent me an email and with your email, Marcus, I think that I needed to, I don't know if I'm going to cover it in the stream. I'm trying to remember. I, I think I need to address it outside of the stream, but if, if I don't answer it, don't hesitate to email me again. Okay. Um, so in restaurant refrigeration, I work with a lot of chain restaurants doing so the customer provides their own equipment. Okay. I get a lot of feedback from people saying, why would you do that? Why would you let a customer provide their own equipment? It's totally different than like a residential situation, okay? And if it's a small restaurant, I wouldn't do that. But big chain restaurants, that's just how it works. Anybody that does chain restaurant work knows that for the most part, they provide their own equipment. Now, I don't go for them providing their own parts. No, that's where I draw the line. But when it comes to equipment replacements, if you want to work with some of the big boys, you just got to accept that one, okay? So they buy their own air conditioning equipment, their own ice machines, and their own refrigerators. I just install them for the most part, okay? Okay. Um, one of the cool things, and I'm not bragging at all because even right now I'm still slow, but for the most part, you know, like the last recession, we stayed pretty busy because we were doing chain restaurant work. So for the most part, they have capital to float them through these crazy times. Now, this time is a little bit more extreme where these restaurants are really cutting back because this is the worst we've ever seen kind of a, uh, economy crash, you know, but anyways, going off on a tangent again. Um, last question that I wanted to address on my recent video is why did I not use a temporary epoxy to seal up the leaks on that evaporator coil in the interim until we get it replaced? I personally am not a fan of using epoxies. To me, to be honest with you, it's kind of a waste of my time. Now, if a customer came to me and said, I want you to use this, then sure, I would consider doing what they said, and, and, and but I would just inform them. Really, I think it's kind of a waste of time. Now, I'm not judging anybody for using an epoxy or anything like that. Um, but I'm just not going to try to sell them something like that. I'd just rather change the equipment if that's what they choose to do and or repair it. Okay. So I'm not a fan of like the epoxies or leak sealants or anything like that. So, uh, that's the two videos that I released this last week. The both ice machines are down video and the produce walking too warm. I'm going to take a look at the chat real quick and then we'll get back to my list of stuff to talk about. Okay. Um, thanks again for becoming a channel supporter. Uh, Jesse Petty. That's awesome, bud. Um, let me see what else. Um, let me see what I'm missing here. Oh, wow. The movie quote already popped up in too. Uh, yeah, it is. This is Spinal Tap is the movie. Um, that's a funny one too. Just the, the stupidity. Yeah, that, that movie is just awesome. It's If you haven't seen This is Spinal Tap, don't sit down and watch it with your family. Just sit down when you're bored. You got nothing else to do. It's going to be the dumbest movie you've ever seen, but it just has some of the funniest scenes in it. It's just, it's, it's funny. So check it out. This is Spinal Tap. Very good movie. Um, yeah, just put some dialogue over the hole. There you go. Uh, let's see. By pulling a deep vacuum, does the oil boil and can it damage the oil? Uh, pulling a deep vacuum, no. I think, in the, again, I'm not a genius when it comes to evacuations, okay? Um, if you want to know more about evacuations, I highly suggest you look up uh, Jim Bergman. Just Google search Jim Bergman uh, evacuation. And you'll find all kinds of videos on YouTube. He does videos for measure quick. He does videos for AccuTools, um, for field piece it, where he taught, uses field piece, vacuum pumps and different things like that. He would be probably the, the easiest person to find information about evacuations. Okay. Um, but, uh, as far as pulling a deep vacuum, what you can pull out in the field, you're not going to hurt the vacuum pump oil. Now, yes, I would imagine if you were in a laboratory and you had scientific equipment under laboratory conditions, I'm sure you could start to vaporize the oil. I'm not 100% on that, but out in the field, you're not going to vaporize the oil. You're not going to damage the oil by pulling too deep of a vacuum. Okay, so hopefully that kind of answers your question. Adam, thank you very much, man. I really appreciate that. Um, that's funny too. I'm going to address that. Thanks for that super chat, Adam. So Adam saw me on the overtime show. So yes, um, it, I'm just going to join the guys whenever I can, when I'm available, it's nothing crazy. Okay. Just, you know, work, work permitting. I plan on, you know, trying to make it to the HVAC overtime show on Friday nights, whenever possible. Um, something I wanted to bring up. So someone in the beginning of the stream, if you guys are just tuning in and also in the beginning of this, I said, 
you know, someone made a comment about me pouring my apple juice. And I always joke around because I usually have a couple beers when I'm doing these live streams. And I'm trying to tone it down a little bit because I don't remember half of the last live stream that I did last week. And then also the overtime show. Yeah, I was drinking quite a bit on the overtime show. And I want to tone it down just a tad bit because uh, it's funny. I was getting ready for this live stream tonight and I was trying to remember like I couldn't remember the last live stream and I had to go back and rewatch it. And, uh, yeah, it's like, oh, wow, I don't even remember talking about that. So, yeah, I need to be cautious about that. So I'm toning it down a little bit. Um, but, yeah, you guys will see me on the overtime show. So um, HVAC kid, when you're 16, can you work for free at an HVACR company in California? No. Um, in California, legally, nobody can work for free. It's, it's a legal nightmare. You can't even do right. Like, it's just a disaster. You cannot work for free in California. Mm -mm. Uh, especially at 16, you've got to get, well, no, you know, I take that back. There's some, there's some ways you can do it. If you apply through a college, uh, in, and when I say you can't work for free, it's, it's insurance reasons and different things like that. Um, and workers comp insurance and stuff, but the way you can skate that, if you want to get experience with an HVAC company here in California, the only way that I know of doing so is by going through a local community college. If you're enrolled in a community college's HVAC program, oftentimes they will have sort of an apprenticeship program set up and they float the insurance. So they have the insurance that covers you. You can go work with a contractor where they can get a feel for you. You can get a feel for what it's like. And technically you're like a student on a ride along with an HVAC company. It's a bunch of legal red tape, and that is one way that you can possibly go do ride-alongs with someone as long as you're enrolled in a community college and you're under their insurance because you're not going to find an HVAC company out there that's willing to have the insurance to, to do that. It's a nightmare, okay? And then there's labor laws and all kinds of stuff. Uh, Zach, did I manage to price a T-shirt to the UK? or um, Yeah, Zach, okay, so... Um let me, let me cover that real quick. Um, I did make an announcement on social media that, and I've, I've said, I've gone back and forth on whether or not I wanted to do this or not, but I decided to go full bore into it. Okay. Um, I did, I'm going through the process right now of getting all the legal crap that I need to have to be able to sell shirts legit. Okay. So I'm going to have shirts and hats. Um, I placed a, huh, that's not good. It says I'm getting a, buffering hopefully i'm not buffering i don't know youtube's messing around right now i'm getting an error message hopefully it clears up i'm just going to keep talking through this but i did get a uh i placed a giant order for shirts um for me giant order i think i ordered like 250 shirts or 280 shirts or something like that i think yeah something like that and then like 40 hats or something um i will be setting up a website I will be selling them legit. I haven't figured out pricing and stuff yet, but I did order the shirts. I'm, you know, in the process of getting the business license and all that stuff. So that's coming through soon. So yeah, California is crazy when it comes to regulations. Now, as far as the UK, that's going to be a little bit difficult. We'll have to figure something out. Shipping stuff overseas. I don't know how I can legally do that, but maybe we can figure something out on the backside of that one. So, okay, that's cool. No buffering. That's cool. It just says on my side that it's going to buffer, but yeah. Oh, well. Um, all right. So if I missed questions, guys, throw them in caps lock. I'll get to them again. Okay. Um, right on, man. We got a lot of people in the stream. Hello to everybody. If you're new in here, hey, thanks for coming. Okay. Um, I've got a list of things. If you guys have questions, please put them in caps lock. I'll try to get to them. Okay. What causes a soft plug to blow on an accumulator? If, if you had a soft plug that blew on an accumulator, that's bad. That means that your system temperature in the soft plug, that or you just had a bad soft plug. Um, are you mean in a receiver an accumulator? That's very interesting. I've never heard of a soft plug blowing in an accumulator, but a soft plug is usually a temperature safety device built into a storage vessel, um, that has a low temperature melting point. Um, usually on most systems around 430 degrees. And if the temperature within the system gets above 430 degrees, then it melts the solder that's on there and it'll allow the refrigerant to vent before you have a catastrophic explosion. Okay. So um, you can either have just a weak soft plug, maybe, or, or someone overheated it from the outside or something. I guess that's a possibility, but I've never heard of a soft plug blowing on a receiver. Um, definitely heard of them, I mean, on an accumulator. Um, let me see what else. Uh, thoughts about project management. Uh, don't know what you mean about that. Uh, send me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com. We can talk about it a little bit more. 
Uh, let's see what else we got. You noticed in my last video that I was charging with liquid into the suction line. Wouldn't that hurt the compressor? Uh, I'm metering liquid into the suction line. So typically when I'm charging a system and when it comes to air conditioning or refrigeration systems, on your initial charge after an evacuation, you put liquid refrigerant um, in through the high side, okay? And you let the system stabilize out. Then once it won't take any more refrigerant or you put a certain amount in, then you take your hose off, you put it on the suction side, you turn the system on, and then you meter it in slowly through a ball valve, okay? Whether it be through your manifold gauge or your smart probe hose or whatever, you meter the refrigerant in. So no, I'm not charging with liquid into the suction side. I may have the tank inverted because you have to charge liquid coming out of a refrigerant tank when you have a blend, okay? But I'm not blasting that compressor with liquid refrigerant, no. All right, let's see what else. Um, Partstown has a lot of manuals as well. Yes, they do, Willie Bryant, and that is a great resource, okay? If you guys don't know what Partstown is, Partstown is, they started out as a, a restaurant refrigeration part source, right? Um, they think they're out of Ohio, if I remember right. Anyways, they giant, they're a giant company now. They've merged with so many different companies. I think they're the biggest parts distributor in the country, maybe even in the world. I don't know. They're huge. Um, but yeah, the, one of their selling points, similar to uh, other companies, is they made an app that had all sorts of manuals. It started with their website. Um, they now sell some air conditioning parts. They sell hot side parts, ovens, fryers, all that stuff. They basically sell all kinds of parts on their website. But they have tons and tons of manuals. So check out partstown.com. Lots of great information on there. Um, let me see what else. Uh, what do we have? I saw a good question come up. Um, how has my business adapted to the new safety protocols? Chris Emery. Okay, so here in Southern California, we are still in a semi-lockdown. I know some other parts of the country, such as Texas and different things, have pretty much relaxed most of their restrictions. Here in California, my restaurants are still shut down, especially Southern California. My restaurants are still to-go only and take-out. You're not allowed to eat in the dining room. But what's happening is, is a lot of people are starting to rebel. We have some restaurants that are actually just opening up and saying f it you know and just opening the doors um, but legally we are still under a sort of lockdown so um, as an essential service i'm allowed to go to work but the service work just isn't there um, as far as the new safety requirements we haven't even figured all that stuff out yet i mean it's crazy right everybody has to wear masks it, it, there's a technicality they say that in certain counties like the county i live in riverside county they said they're not enforcing masks, they're not enforcing social distancing, but they recommend it, okay? But um, other counties, you still have to, according to the state, you still have to social distance. You st it's just like a big political nightmare, okay? Um, but adapting to everything, we're still figuring everything out. Every day, there's something new. So um, we all wear masks when we're at work. I, I just use a neck gaiter, which really doesn't do anything. Absolutely nothing. It doesn't protect me from anything. It just keeps me from spitting when I talk. That's all it does. Um I wear gloves. I wash my hands. I keep hand sanitizer in my van. That's pretty much it. You know, me, my family and I, we went out this weekend, um, went to our local mountains. We spent Saturday and Sunday. We just kept driving home and going back up. We spent Saturday and Sunday in our local mountains, just walking around. They had some lake, uh, regional park open. We were hanging out there up in, uh, for those that are in Southern California, we basically spent the weekend up at Lake Gregory and Crestline. Um, and then we went between Crestline and Lake Arrowhead and some of the towns in between, and we were just out, you know, enjoying life. Um, yesterday, we went up to a, a picnic spot, got some food, you know, had tacos down by the lake, and then went out and set up the slack line between two trees and set up a hammock and just hung out and watched the sunset. Um, but anyways, I'm going off on a tangent about what we did, but um, it's very interesting. It's still new to us. Like, you know, when we were out shop, uh, on Sun, no, Saturday when we were out, uh, we had gone somewhere and my kids didn't have their mask with them. And so we went to a grocery store to get some drinks and the sign said masks suggested. So we went in the grocery store without masks. It was kind of weird. It was the first time we'd walked in public without masks. And it's it's a whole thing. So we don't know what we're doing yet. We're just learning everything every day. Um, as far as the business goes, it's just as bad. We don't know. It's a nightmare. All right. Um, apart from electrical risks during servicing, are the gases any way harmful yes alex mc um yeah some of the gases and refrigerants that we work with yes they are harmful uh inhalation yes you don't want to breathe any of the refrigerants because they're all cancer causing substances they're all toxic um, they're not good for your health uh they're low temperatures they'll displace oxygen you could suffocate from them let alone some of the new ones are poisonous they have 
uh, some of the old ones have chlorine gas in them. Um, some of them have uh, are flammable refrigerants. So yes, any of the refrigerants, they can be dangerous. You have to know how to operate and work with them safely. Um, I need to sell signed shirts. I don't know about signing shirts. That's kind of weird. Um, yeah, I'll have information available soon about the hats and different things like that. Okay. So I'll have a website set up where people can go and, and do all that stuff. I already have the website. I just haven't made it public basically, or I have the domain, I should say. Um, but anyways, yeah, we'll, ha I'll put more details out there and I'll make it publicly known. Um, and don't worry. I, I only bought like 240 shirts or something like that. That was a big investment for me. That was a couple thousand dollars in shirts I had to buy. Um, and I'm pretty confident I'll sell them, but it's still kind of a gamble, kind of scary to spend that much money. But once I receive them and get some pictures of them, I'll put them up on a website and then we'll make them available to be sold and all that good stuff. Um, let me see what else we got going on. Do I think it's best practice to cut it out unbrazed filter dryers? Okay. I've covered that many times, Mr. V Cappuccino. Okay. When you're working on refrigerant systems, it is always best practice to cut out a dryer. Okay. But... I've been trying to stress this as much as possible lately. There's best practice and there's practical, okay? You have to find a happy medium between the two. Of course, best practice is to pull a perfect, you know, 150 to 200 micron vacuum and make sure that it doesn't pass a, or that it passes a decay test not rising over 500 microns, okay? That's not practical, okay? That's best practice, but it's not practical. Of course, every time that you're brazing on a system, you should be purging with nitrogen or flowing with nitrogen to uh, basically keep um, contaminants from forming on the inside of the pipe and plugging up your refrigerant system. But it's not always practical. So you as a technician have to find a happy medium between best practices and practical, okay? Um, cutting a dryer out. If I can, sure, but it's not always practical because I work in restaurant refrigeration. I work on very small equipment. It's very tight. Sometimes you can't even get a cutter in there or there's not enough refrigerant line to put a different dryer in there, okay? So you have to find that happy medium between there. I wish that schools preach that more because I find that kids coming out of school will message me and say, and there's nothing wrong with it, but it just, just understand. I'll get messages. You know, I work for this company. I just started here and, you know, I went to school and they told me to do all this different stuff and... When I get to this job, they're not doing that and they're all hacks. I think I should go somewhere else. And it's like, no, 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 no. Bite your tongue, stay for a while, learn what's practical, and then make your decision. Okay. But coming out of school, I understand why teachers teach that stuff. It's just, it's, there's a fine line there. Okay. Sometimes I argue though, because I've had teachers walk up to me and I'm not a perfect technician, but I was at the AHR show and I had a couple different, um, I think three different instructors walk up to me amongst several people and say, Hey, my students watch your videos. And then one of them was like, you know, but I see you doing a lot of wrong things and I have a problem with that. Okay. That's fine. I, I don't do everything correctly. But you know, when, when, when someone comes up to me or someone sends me an email saying, you know, you didn't pull a perfect vacuum. I kind of like to question them on what they actually think a perfect vacuum is because these people that talk a lot of crap and say that this vacuum needs to be perfect half the time they don't even know what pulling a perfect vacuum is they just think of a number 500 microns and they think that's perfect well in practicality when you're working on low temp you need to pull a lot lower than that at the same time they're preaching to pull a vacuum with your manifold that's not always perfect okay you shouldn't pull a vacuum with a manifold now there's practical and not practical right I don't always pull a vacuum without a manifold. Sometimes I do use a manifold, but I understand the difference on, you know, what's right and what's wrong. So anyways, I went off on a tangent again, but hopefully I answered your question for you there, but okay. Um, let's see. What am I missing in here? Do I think, okay, I already answered that one. Uh, how do I compete with being big picture when there's guys that will come in and be little picture? Great question, Mr. Ice. That is an awesome question. Okay. Um, first off, I am not the perfect business, right? There's some of my competitors right now and still have been busy this entire time. And in the midst of this whole virus thing, I'm dead. All my guys were laid off up until two weeks ago. You know, we were out of work for basically five weeks and we were dead. Okay. I'm sure that my big picture mindset has a little bit to do with that. So I am not perfect when it comes to a business, but how do I compete? I, I, there's a fine line. Okay. But I have to do what lets me sleep at nighttime. And I do my diagnosis, but at the same time, I also need you guys to understand that just because I do a big picture diagnosis doesn't mean that the customer lets me do the big picture repair. Okay. When I give them a quote and I say, 
it's going to cost this much to do it. Sometimes they don't choose to do it, you know? So sometimes I don't get to sell them the big picture repair. All right. But I always try to give them a big picture diagnosis. I always try to give them the information and say, this is what's going on. It was caused by this, this, and this, and we can remedy it by doing all this, or we can just fix the problem right here you know, and let them make those decisions. So I always put the tools in the customer's hands and let them make the decisions. I just try to educate them as much as possible. That was a great question though. Uh, advice for new residential techs. Um, Francis, okay, go to work with an open mind, learn how to keep your mouth shut. And I don't mean that you can't express opinions, but you got to know when the right time to say something to your boss or to ask questions is okay. Observe everything, take pictures of everything. And when you get off work, your job is just starting because I want you when you're at work to be taking pictures without getting in trouble of all the equipment, nothing sensitive, all the models, all the serial numbers going home and researching when you get home. Okay. This actually segues into a great question that I had and it's right here. Someone had asked me and I have it on my list. Where is it at? So I can mark it off as I covered it. Ah, right here. So someone had asked me what online resources there are for education, okay? Uh, if you're looking for an online resource for education, of course, I would highly suggest you go to sporlin.com. Sporlin is a sponsor of my videos, um, but they have a lot of great resources on their website when it comes to not just their parts, but just refrigeration and air conditioning in general, okay? The next best thing is to go check out my buddy Brian Orr's website, hvacrschool.com. Go to hvacrschool.com. You'll find a great plethora of information on Brian's website, okay? He does YouTube videos. He does podcasts. He does uh, tech tips. He has links to industry resources. He's an amazing dude. I don't know how the guy sleeps. Just do some research. Check out HVACRschool.com, okay? I got no affiliation with Brian other than just being acquainted with him, but he has a great website, so I'm always going to recommend it, okay? Um, let me see what else I'm missing in here. Uh, how is my and, – and forgive me if I'm skipping questions, guys. The, the chat, like, bounces back and forth, and I don't get to them, okay? Um, ah, Ernesto, you said you were told why you use expensive Viper Cleaner in your last video. That was wasting too much money. Okay, so Ernesto is saying that in one of his videos, he was asked why he used expensive Viper cleaner. Okay, so Viper is a manufacturer's trademarked name, uh, Refrigeration Technologies, and they have a lot of different products out there, okay? They have uh, evaporator cleaners, condenser cleaners, they make Nylog, they have hand cleaners, they have hand sanitizers, they have all sorts of different products, okay? Okay. Refrigeration Technologies is a small company. That is a fair thing to say. You know, I would say that maybe their prices are a little bit high, but they're not horrendous. I wouldn't call them an expensive cleaner. When it comes to the competitor, New Calgon, you know, they're the big industry, big boy across the country, right? They're everywhere. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say that Refrigeration Technologies cleaners are too expensive. Now, I will say that, you know, for instance, if you look at it and you don't look at it in context, you know, you may buy a jug of Refrigeration Technologies Viper HD cleaner, which is completely metal safe, micro channel cleaner. I highly recommend it. But um, you got to use it the way that they recommend you use it. You got to use the dilution ratio. Okay, You can't go grab one of Refrigeration Technologies cleaner and just pour it in a um, new Calgon coil cleaner sprayer, right? And then think it's going to work the same because Refrigeration Technologies actually has their own sprayer and it has a different dilution ratio. So if you follow Refrigeration Technologies dilution ratios, I bet you anything that you would find that it's not that expensive of a cleaner, okay? The cool thing about a lot of Refrigeration Technologies cleaners um, is that uh, they, they're, they're, they're metal safe, they're environmentally friendly, um, you know, they're not going to burn your skin off. Uh, there's other cleaners out there that if you get them on your hands, I had a technician that got a condenser coil cleaner in his shoe. He doesn't work for us anymore. I'm not going to name his name. There's a lot of mistakes that went through this, but he got condenser coil cleaner in his shoe and he didn't do anything about it. And he worked through the rest of the day with a wet sock of condenser coil cleaner. Um, if I remember right, he didn't come to work for three weeks because he had an infection in his foot and it ate the skin away and got nasty. Okay. I'm not saying that refrigeration technologies cleaners wouldn't hurt your skin like that. I mean, that was some mistakes on his part too, because he should have taken his sock off and cleaned his foot right away with any cleaner. You have to follow their instructions, but I'm just saying that 
Um, refrigeration technologies, cleaners, almost all of them are a lot less, um, I think caustic might be the right word. I know that's a big word that I may not understand completely, but that, that sounds like a good word to use. But they're a lot less harmful when it comes to your skin and the roof materials and different things like that. So, um, yeah, anyways, again, another tangent on that one. Uh, also, uh, Ernesto is HVACR vlogger. He's a, uh, a technician here in the Northern California area, and uh, he makes technician service call videos. You guys should check out his channel too. So... Um, what is the difference in efficiency between microchannel and slant thin condensers? I'm assuming that you mean standard tube and fin condensers compared to microchannel. Tube and fin condensers are you have a copper line with a, a tube sheet of aluminum fins for the most part that are pushed over it, and the aluminum fins help to absorb the heat to travel, you know, it gets to the copper faster. Microchannel is kind of like a radiator in a car. Um, and it's a lot more efficient. So the efficiency difference is tenfold, right? Microchannel condensers are highly, highly efficient, okay? You'll notice that in that the condensers are a lot smaller as far as the surface area goes. Um, the refrigerant charge required for a microchannel condenser is like a third of the refrigerant charge on most tube and fin condensers. Um, so overall, energy efficiency, um, refrigerant amounts are lower, heat load on the equipment is absorbed better, um, so yeah, micro channel is much more efficient, but on the flip side, there's some problems with micro channel too. Oftentimes they're aluminum. Well, they are aluminum and the aluminum to copper connections in the very beginning were a weak point. The manufacturers weren't using the proper materials to, to join the two aluminum and copper together. Um, they were doing all kinds of silly things. There was a lot of refrigerant issues. Even to this day, the micro channel condensers have gotten a bad name because, uh, People don't pay attention when they're trying to pump down, especially residential air conditioning systems. There's a rule out there that you don't ever pump down a microchannel condenser on a residential system. Well, it's not really a rule. The reason why they say that is because people aren't using their brain when they're pumping systems down, okay? So depending on the residential air conditioner that you're working on, if you're doing a pump down and you close the service valve on the outlet of the condenser on some manufacturer's equipment, the Schrader port no longer has true pressure in the system, okay? You're reading the line set pressure. Now, this isn't on all of them, but on some of them, this is the case. So with that being said, if you happen to have an overcharged system and you try to do a pump down and say you've got your gauges on there and you're seeing the, the, the high side pressure and the low side pressure drop as it's trying to pump down, well, what's happening inside the system you're not seeing because the pressure's on the other side of that valve and that pressure is climbing and climbing and climbing. On most residential air conditioning systems, they don't have high pressure controls, especially in the beginning. So there's nothing there to protect that condenser from overpressurizing, okay? Now, I'm not saying that that solves everything. And some equipment manufacturers have changed the orientation of their valves. But in the beginning, you had a lot of explosions and, and ruptures from microchannel condensers. Well, some of them were just simply because people weren't paying attention when they had their gauges on there and they weren't getting a true high side pressure reading and they were trying to pump it down, okay? Also, if you try to pump down a microchannel condenser and it's overcharged, that refrigerant has to go somewhere. So at some point, something's got to give, right? So it's going to be the aluminum. It's going to be the compressor head. It's going to be the copper line. Well, I can tell you that more than likely the copper line's not going to give and the compressor head's not going to give unless there's a soft plug somewhere in that system, more than likely it's going to be an aluminum connection that's going to start leaking. So again, going off on a tangent as usual, uh, but the efficiency difference is tenfold. Okay. Advice. I already answered that question. How is my supply houses dealing with COVID? Are we having to do pickups or deliveries? Adam Neal. So our supply houses basically, um, uh, they aren't allowing us to go in the supply houses and I'm going to discuss the problem with that, but we basically pull up to the back dock where they get deliveries we call them, we say, hey, we need to pick up this part. We tell them over the phone, they bring it to us, we sign a piece of paper and we go, okay? They will deliver to our job site too, but that takes a while because people are having a hard time. Everybody's trying to get deliveries. Now, one of the downsides, Jason Huffman, thank you so very much for that super chat, man. That's awesome. Thank you, thank you. Um, one of the downsides to supply houses not letting us go inside is on the manufacturer's side. Let's just say field piece, for instance, right? Field piece makes the, the gauges and stuff that I use all the time. Well, field piece is going to start to see a decline in their sales because they don't get those counter sales right now. 
So in order for someone to go buy a set of field piece gauges at the supply house, they have to ask for them instead of walking into the supply house and seeing them hanging behind the counter and going, ooh, I want those, ooh, I want those, ooh, I want those, and then finally buying them, right? So manufacturers are starting to have to look at other avenues to push their tools, i.e., you know, influencers on YouTube and Instagram notice that you guys have seen, and I'm not knocking anybody because, you know, I would be willing to do it too, but notice that you see more people on Instagram pushing tools these days. Um, people like true tech tools is doing really good as far as sales go, because they have an online resource. They work with me. I can show tools in my videos. I mean, so everything's having to change as far as the supply house goes. Okay. Uh, it also creates a dilemma too, because you know, normally when I go to a supply house, honestly, I would just say, Hey guys, I need to go get some parts. I'll walk into the back of the shop. They're cool with it. I pick everything I want and I bring it out instead of having to describe to the counter guy what I want. Cause oftentimes I know exactly what I want. And half the time I know exactly where it is in the supply house. And sometimes the counter guys don't. So it stopped that because now I have to describe everything again to them. So it's a dilemma. We're having to work through everything with this. Um, let me see. How do I make sure I don't have a restriction before I charge? Uh, well, that's a loaded question, bud, but your system vitals is really going to make a difference. You do a full system anal uh, analysis before you put your uh, you start adding refrigerant. So you're going to see it depending on what you're working on. Your subcooling is going to be really high or really low. You're, you know, you're going to see it in your system vitals for sure. Okay. If I, if you, it, that's kind of a loaded question, so feel free to send me an email. Um, I'm going to get to a couple questions that I have on my list right here before I forget. Um, I already talked about it and I'll mention it again. No, I already talked about that. I'm going to take that off the list. A great question that I had was a technician emailed me and he said that he just got out of school and his teacher was, and this happens with a lot of trade schools. His teacher was talking about, uh, airflow it was like the number one thing that they taught when he was in school. But he also said that when he was in school, they were pushing more residential training than commercial training. And that's a very common thing because it's easier to teach residential than it is commercial as far as resources and things like that. Schools are better set up to teach residential. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? Because the concepts are still the same, just more controls and complexity added to the system when you go into commercial. But the question he had was when he was in school, his teacher always said, before you work on an air conditioner, before you try to evaluate the system, you always check airflow. And he said, when he got to commercial, that's what he's doing now. They don't do that as much. And he was curious what the difference between commercial and residential was and why we weren't as concerned in commercial about airflow. Well, in fact, we are. Airflow is everything when it comes to residential, commercial, or refrigeration. That is the key to everything. If you do not have airflow in commercial refrigeration, you do not have refrigerated equipment. It's not going to be cooling your load. If you do not have airflow in commercial air conditioning, same thing. You're not going to cool your load. Same thing in residential. But what I'm going to say when you're dealing with residential and commercial air conditioning, I'm going to step out on a limb here and I'm going to say airflow is one of the hardest things to accurately measure. There's all sorts of airflow methods. I was recently having a, a discussion with a guy at a counter at a, I mean, at a, a, that I met behind a supply house that recognized me from my videos and we were having a discussion about airflow. Okay. Airflow is one of the hardest things to accurately measure. So the most important thing, in my opinion, my, my experience is that you have to understand that nothing is perfect, okay? Let's just say that you're going to use a hot wire anemometer and you're going to traverse the duct where you basically, here, hold on. I have one, so I'm going to grab it. So let's say that you were going to traverse the duct with a hot wire anemometer, okay? So what you're going to do is you're going to take a, um, this is a uh, field piece STA2, okay? This is an in-duct hot wire anemometer. And you're going to take this air probe and pull this off. And you're going to put this little chingus in the airstream. It telescopes out. It's a great tool. You put it into the ductwork and you take average readings over multiple places of the ductwork. You're going to traverse it. So you do one at four inches, one at eight inches, one at 12 inches, one at 
16 inches and then you 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 go over two inches and you traverse the entire length and width of the of a certain section or actually just just height or whatever of a certain section of duct but the reason why you do a traverse and you get multiple readings is because you're taking an average okay because in certain points in the duct work there's turbulence there's all kinds of problems okay so this can be easily mismeasured this is a great tool there's absolutely nothing wrong with it but if you don't do everything correctly, you can get incorrect information, okay? Also, if there's things in the ductwork that you don't know about, like turning veins that are very close to where you're getting measurements, your measurement numbers can be skewed, okay? So let's take this out of the picture. Let's go buy a really expensive, fancy flow hood. And you put a flow hood. A flow hood is a funnel-type device. You put it on a diffuser. It takes a measurement. Okay, let's say you use a flow hood. Um, when you put a flow hood up to a supply grill, okay, it, most flow hoods, some of the newer ones, they've compensated for this, but it creates an air restriction. And if you don't compensate for that air restriction when you put it up to the ductwork, what's going to happen is as you put it up there, the flow has just been increased further down the line because you created a restriction for it to go through. And a flow hood works very similarly to a hot wire anemometer, okay? Um, so if you do that then and you don't understand how a flow hood's working or you don't use it right, you can get an incorrect reading, okay? Let's say you put a, um, there's another measurement to a true flow grid. It's basically just a bunch of manometers um, or pitot tubes, basically, not manometers, pitot tubes in a line, and it gives you air, air flow. That's a very good method of doing it, but it's not very practical because most people don't have a multiple thousands of dollars flow grid array to be able to put into a commercial unit. I was once doing a airflow calculation with an energy auditor and he brought out um, true grid flow whatever things and he was making measurements and it was so silly what he had to do to make them fit in a giant commercial package unit. He had like blanked it off with cardboard and was doing all kinds of crap. He must have had I think 12 different panels of the true flow grid. It was silly. Okay. So airflow is just as important, but you have to understand that no matter what method you're doing, there's still some sort of estimation there because air is one of the hardest things to accurately measure. Okay. You could do, um, pressure drop, uh, total external static pressure, use fan tables. That's an estimation. So as long as you understand that most of the stuff out there is an estimation. Okay. And also airflow is changing every second. So if you have all this different fancy stuff, if I did a traverse, the moment I pull it out of the duct, airflow just changed again. Airflow is not a constant airflow all the time. Things in the ductwork slow it down. If your evaporator starts to get loaded with moisture, the airflow slows down. Different things happen in a system to mess with airflow, okay? Um, digital tools make it easier to measure, but understanding that airflow is not a perfect measurement is very important, okay? So, how do we measure airflow in commercial? We make a lot of estimations, okay? Uh, what I typically do is I use an app called Measure Quick. It makes some estimations based off of some um, uh, temperature readings, okay? Uh, it's nothing really secretive. It's just some backwards way. I think it uses the mass flow calculation and a couple different things, but everything is an estimation. So you have to know how to interpret that data and understand that nothing is perfect. But as I went off on a freaking 15 minute tangent, the most important thing to understand is, is airflow is one of the most important things. If you do not have proper airflow, adjusting superheat, subcooling, all that stuff means nothing because you can fake out the superheat and subcooling numbers if your airflow is not correct, okay? So sorry I went off on a rant, but hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to you, okay? Um, I'm scrolling down to the bottom of the feed and see what else. Uh, did I ever use the super cool slide rule when I was just coming into the trade? Yeah, I thought the super cool slide rule was a great, great, um, tool. It was a slide rule and it had all sorts of great information on it. You know, the coolest thing that the super cool slide rule had on it, um, is it had a flex duct calculator, right? So we've all seen duct calculators, right? For years we had the round ones and different things, but most people didn't understand that duct calculators were for metal duct and not flex duct because there's a different pressure drop across a flex duct versus a metal duct. So the super cool slide rule was one of the first tools that had a f that I found, right? It wasn't the first one, but it was one of the tools that consolidated a lot of information and it had a flex duct calculator. So I always loved that. Thought that was really cool. All right, let's see what else. What do I think of converting a walk-in freezer to a cooler? Um, it depends on how you want to do it. Have I done conversions? Yes. Uh, walk-in freezer to a cooler, that's a somewhat easy one, but something you have to understand if you want to do it accurately, depending on how much runtime you're going to have 
is you're not going to have the comp correct compressor cooling coming back to that compressor. So remember, our compressors typically are refrigerant cooled. So on a walk-in freezer, they're relying on that very low suction gas temperature coming back to the compressor to cool the windings, okay? If you put it on a walk-in cooler, you're going to have much warmer. You're going to have basically 25 degrees suction gas coming back to that compressor, you know, as an estimation, as opposed to negative 15 degrees suction gas coming back to the compressor, okay? So over extended periods of runtime, you might have some overheat issues on that compressor. Also, if you convert a walk-in freezer to a walk-in cooler, your equipment is now gonna be grossly oversized because our equipment gets bigger as we go lower in temperature. So you're gonna have a massively oversized walk-in cooler. But it can be done, it's just how, how correct do you wanna go with it? Uh, does overamping cause a locked up condenser fan motor? Overamping can cause the condenser fan motor to overheat internally. It can cause damage to the windings of the motor. It can also cause too much heat in the motor. Uh, I imagine if you think about it that way, it could probably cause some bearing failures and different things like that. So inevitably, yes, if you overamp a motor for too long, I guess it would lead to a locked rotor amp situation. Yeah. Um, also, though, when it comes to motors, you have the safety factor, which is a temporarily or it's it's the safety factor is basically um, a safety number that they give you as far as maximum current draw that you can temporarily operate at. Okay. So you do have a safety factor built into a motor that will often let you over amp slightly, but not for extended periods of time. Uh, they put that in there. I believe I, I'm talking out of my ass right now, but I believe they put that in there for like startup situations and things like that or heavy load situations. So that way every once in a while it can over amp, but then it drops back down to normal operating amps. But uh, I'm, I gotta be very careful about that because I could be talking out of my ass. Um, have I ever worked on hydronics and do I prefer air over water for heating? I've never done heating as far as hydronics. The most as far as hydronics go is um, I've worked on water cooled refrigeration equipment. Um, so no heating systems, never worked on steam or anything like that. Um, you know, I think it's more efficient using water, but unfortunately here in California, water is a, re a scarce resource. So uh, they don't really they, they don't really want you using water for cooling anymore when it comes to refrigeration, unless you have a closed loop system. Like I used to do work for a hospital that had semi closed loops, kind of, you know, they still had a uh, evaporative cooler outside tower. So, you know, evaporate water would evaporate out of that. But anyways, um, let's see what else. Uh, what are my thoughts on UV lights, Mr. Psycho? Okay, I have to be careful here. Um, I am not a believer in UV lights and all those different things, okay? Um, just not my cup of tea, all right? I am more of a believer, and again, I have no scientific evidence here, okay? I'm not educated on UV lights. I've read some information, but I'm more of a believer in fresh air and cleaning that fresh air, okay? Uh, I do know that the dirtiest air you will ever breathe is in your home. And, or for the most part, majority of us, the dirtiest air we'll ever breathe is in our home. And where have we been locked up for the longest time now? In our homes. Okay. And most of our homes, mine has absolutely no fresh air coming into my house. It's just recirculating the air that we're breathing. Now, granted, my house has a lot of air leaks, so we do get air exchanges in that direction. But no, I'm not a fan of UV lights. Um, but again, I have no scientific evidence other than things that I've read or watched to, 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 to stand behind my claim of I don't care for UV lights. So. Uh, there could be a drinking game every time the word tangent is used. Dude, you could do drinking games for so much. You could do it for tangent. You could do it for um or, uh, you know, like I have so many crutch words that I use. But, yeah, tangent for sure. Uh, how do I explain to my customers that I'm filming? Uh, do they even know that I'm filming? Uh, so that's a sticky situation. So, okay, let me preface that by saying, first off, I genuinely – the way that I act on a video when I am filming, that is how I act. My troubleshooting process, I vocalize things. So when I am working by myself and I am not videoing, I'm not kidding with you. I am talking to myself. I'm probably insane. I know there's some kind of, I know I'm diagnosed all kinds of weird crap, but so I vocalize things. That's my thought process. So when I'm, when I'm working through something, I talk, okay, I check this, I check that I'm talking. So turning a camera on really isn't any different for me. Now, do I go to my customers and say, you know, oh my gosh, I need you to sign this waiver. I'm filming this. Come on. I'm not going to go too much further with that one, but you're not going to get customers to sign off on anything. So that's about as far as I'm going to take it with that one. Okay. But you guys get the gist. 
All right. What would be the reason for a liquid line solenoid valve to rattle really loud when it gets energized? There's a couple different me uh, things that could be causing that. Um, you could have bad connection with the coil. If the set screw in the top of the coil is missing, that can cause some chattering. Uh, the contact, the coil itself could be going bad. The plastic inside of it could be getting elongated. Um, you could have a bad solenoid valve. I mean, there's a million different methods. I would start by tightening down the set screw, making sure it's tight, try replacing the coil. If not, just replace the whole valve and see what happens. Um, but make sure that the valve is adequately sized. You don't want to oversize a solenoid valve. You don't want to undersize a solenoid valve. You undersize it. It doesn't allow proper flow, but you oversize it depending on the type of solenoid valve. It might not ever close because it might require on, uh, you know, use that system pressure and it might not be able to close. So there's all kinds of, you got to make sure it's sized correctly and then start a you know, troubleshooting past that point. All right, I'm gonna get to my list of things right here and cover a couple more topics on here. Um, question that I had was about hard start kits. Do I use hard start kits? Okay. Um, they were asking me what a hard start kit does. They were worried about companies selling hard start kits. Okay, so the, the whole theory behind a hard start kit, a hard start kit for the most part is a start capacitor that is added to a system that otherwise didn't have a start capacitor. They usually have a potential relay built into the start capacitor. Um, they will oftentimes, they call them a hard start kit because that is actually a manufacturer's trademarked name of their particular compressor start device, okay? So am I a fan of aftermarket hard start kits? No, I'm not, okay? The concept of an aftermarket hard start kit is a good idea. It reduces the inrush current on the compressor, reducing the temperature of the start winding, causing less uh, issues with the compressor, theoretically elongating, elongating the life of the compressor. Yes, I agree that that is a good thing. Where I don't like is aftermarket hard start kits. I am a fan of leaning on the manufacturer, such as Copeland. If you go to the Copeland mobile app, here goes my, and you guys should do a drinking game every time my nose starts itching, right? I'm getting the Coke nose again. Um, you go to the Copeland mobile app, and you input a model number of a residential air conditioning compressor, okay? And you notice that on most residential air conditioning compressors, if it has the factory starting component, it's just a run capacitor. It doesn't have a hard start kit. It doesn't have a start cap. It doesn't have a potential relay for most of them, okay? But if you look on the Copeland mobile app, or even in the manufacturer's data for that, that compressor, they'll tell you that there is a compressor start device available. Copeland will recommend the correct start capacitor and potential relay to add to the system to help if you have starting problems, okay? Um, but am I saying that a hard start kit for an aftermarket case would not get you through a bind? No, I've put hard start kits on compressors, okay? After the fact, like let's say you have a bad compressor, it won't start. Check it out, it's got power, it's got continuity, but the thing just won't start. Okay, oftentimes you can try putting a hard start kit on there and it might help, okay? It might start the compressor up. It's good to let the customer know that it's probably not going to last very long and go. Okay, now, do I suggest going to every residential air conditioning system out there and putting a hard start kit on it from install? If the manufacturer of that compressor says to put it on there, then I say go for it. If they give you correct ones to put on there, what you have to be careful about when it comes to a potential relay and a start capacitor is overheating of the start winding. And if you apply it and the, 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 the dropout voltage of the potential relay doesn't kick out fast enough, you could damage the compressor. So I suggest using manufacturers OEM recommended capacitors and overloads instead of adding an aftermarket start device on your compressor. That's just my two cents. Again, um, that's just using common logic that I have in my head. I'm not a genius when it comes to the electronic workings of a compressor and you know, you want me to define inrush current, yeah, you're going over my head, okay? Um, but I just would rather not put something that the manufacturer doesn't recommend. All right. Yeah, exactly, Willie Bryant. Touching my nose, you guys should be done by now. Um, yeah, it is that dirty indoor air. My house has a horrible system. Um, Miguel says, uh, you have to take the law trade again if you want to get your refrigeration license, or can you just contact the state license board and get a test date for the refrigeration part? I have no idea, Miguel Martinez, because... 
What do you mean? Do you have to take the law and trade again? And the, I don't know where you're from, Miguel. So send me an email. Give me some more context. What state do you live in and what exactly is the test? Here in California, we don't have any license to be a refrigeration technician. The only thing you have to have is a contractor's license to own your own business. And you have to have an EPA certification test that says, you know, it's illegal to vent refrigerant. That's it. All right. Let's see what else we got in here. Do I have any dealings with Danfoss parts? Adam Neal. So there's a lot of Danfoss components on Manitowoc ice machines and Delfield refrigerators. So yes, I come across Danfoss parts all the time. Most of the time they're OEM. Um, yeah, I'm not going to talk crap about Danfoss, but I'm a Sporlin fan when it comes to aftermarket filter dryers and expansion valves and different things like that. But I do use Danfoss components because if they're you know OEM components, I like to put OEM back in there. So... Um, all right, let me see. Uh, yeah, okay, so it looks like that one. Okay, I'm going to get to my list. Um, system, oh, wait, there was another question in here. Okay, so I already answered that. And then the second part of this question was someone was asking me about an acid neutralizer that you would add to a compressor after a burnout. I'm not a fan of acid neutralizers. Again, I am not a chemist. I've heard a few people talk. In fact, John Pastorello, the founder of Refrigeration Technologies, uh, did a really interesting podcast episode with Brian Orr on HVACR School. If you just look up John Pastorello um, on HVACR School search tab, right, you'll, you'll hear a great podcast from uh, John. And he kind of talks about why you shouldn't use system additives. Okay. And John doesn't make additives. So it's, it's not affecting him. John was just a dude breaking down the chemistry behind the additives and how they create salts in the system, if I remember right, and just lead to more acids later down the line. Again, I'm not a chemist. It's just what I read. But I don't like using additives. I don't use acid neutralizers. I did in the past, and I will preface this by saying that the first part of my career, I used acid away in every single compressor. And to my knowledge, I never had a problem with that compressor. Okay, I never, I never found a compressor that acid neutralizer killed the compressor that I knew of. Okay, but I have just making made a decision to not use additives in my system, whether it be leak sealers or acid neutralizers or even dyes. Okay. But I'm not saying I've never used a dye. I'm not saying I've never used an additive, but I prefer not to. Okay. So that answers that one. Um, let me see if I'm missing anything in here. Um, oh, can you open a business without a warm air license? Willie Bryant, Willie Bryant. Uh, if you're not going to do any air conditioning, if you're going to do air conditioning, then you have to have a warm air here in California. You, you have to have your air conditioning license. So, um, if you're going to do refrigeration, you could just, what is it? C20 and C38. I can't remember which one's which, but those are the licenses that we hold. One of them's air conditioning. One of them's refrigeration. So, um, yeah, if, if, if you, you guys need to type your questions in caps lock. Um, oh, wait, no, I see it now. Ivan, pressure and low side go up and down. What would be the problem you're thinking about is a bad TXV? Oh, okay, Ivan, that's a really loaded question. There's a lot of information. Before you just say a bad TXV, the pressure in the system going up and down can be caused by a bunch of different things. Is your airflow correct? I don't even know if it's a refrigeration and air conditioning system. There's so much more that goes to it. So you need all you need to verify your airflow is correct. You need to check your refrigerant pressures. You need to verify what the manufacturer spec, the condenser TD at. That'll tell you what your head pressure should be at. You need to verify what the recommended evaporator TD is. That'll tell you what the suction pressure should be. Then you need to, you know, so there's a lot of information you need to have before we just diagnose a TXV because pressures keep going up and down. It, it's hard to say. It could be all kinds of things causing the pressure to go up and down. Um, all right. What phone apps would I recommend to the HVACR tech? Adam Neal. Um, gosh, I keep saying I'm going to do that one, but send me an email, Adam, and I'll try to make a video or include it in the next live stream where I talk about my phone apps because uh, it, it's a really easy. I've done it on a live stream many, probably a year ago. It's really easy. I just have to hook up my phone and set something up, and I can go through my phone apps on the screen, but I can't do it right now. So send me an email. Um, in California, their preschool, can you pay... In California, their preschool, you can pay and take it helps. Oh, I think you mean like uh, HVAC grandpa. I think you mean like a pretest or something, I think is what you're trying to say. Um, 
Do I have any tips for working with R290? R290 is nothing too crazy. You just got to follow some safety practices before you, you it, when at all possible, you want to try to cut components out, but you also have to understand practical versus best practice. That's what I was talking about earlier. On R290 systems, yeah, it's best practice to cut the dryer out, but it's not always practical because they're tiny systems and you don't have room to get a cutter in there. And so use common sense, purge the system with nitrogen, make sure all the valves, anything that would stop the refrigerant flow are open, sweep the system with nitrogen. If you're gonna unbraze components, be prepared for a flame out, have extinguishers, wet towels, spray bottles ready, okay? Be in a well-ventilated area. Just use some safety practices, understanding that the refrigerant is flammable. And even if you sweep a system, I've shown it in some R290 videos, even if you sweep a system with nitrogen, you, you have it coming out the suction side, you're putting it in the high side. I've taken a compressor completely out of the system and then taken a torch after the system's been sitting open to atmosphere, taken a torch across one of the lines and it ignited like a lighter. And there's a little flame coming out of it and it's just burning off all the trapped vapor with no compressor in the system. So there's gonna be vapor pockets. Just because you purged with nitrogen doesn't mean there's no flammable vapor still in the system. So. Um, I have a couple videos on it. Just search on my channel, R290. All right. Uh, corroded copper and evaporator coils. Um, people are asking me, you know, why does copper get so corroded on that walk-in cooler video that I had? Well, oftentimes that was a produce walk-in. So there's lots of things in the produce. There's lots of acids. They have fruit in there. And anything with citric acid, vinegars, um, and some produce naturally has acid it gets airborne and it deteriorates copper. So it just naturally happens. You can coat coils all day long, but eventually things are gonna rot away. Same thing if you have a condenser sitting by the ocean. You can get a coated coil, they put a protective coating on that, but that just gets you a little bit more time. Eventually, the elements are gonna eat it away, okay? Uh, most customers, when it comes to their equipment, they don't protect their equipment as far as covering their products up correctly and things, and it causes you know issues with the equipment too. Uh, airborne contaminants just eat away at the copper. Um, let's see if there is leaks in the system, like for instance, in my walk-in cooler video where there was oil on there, someone said, you know, and it was a logical question. They said, so you fix the leaks. Do you add oil to the system? Well, it really depends. First off a little bit of refrigerant oil. I was told this at a very young age and I learned it really quickly. An ounce of refrigerant oil goes a mile. Okay, especially when it's vaporized, right? So when it's coming out of a leak, the tiniest bit of refrigerant oil just covers everything, okay? So do I add oil to every system that has a refrigerant leak? No, not necessarily. It depends on how much oil I see in the system. Now, oftentimes, compressors don't have sight glasses, especially on the smaller stuff. So you have no idea how much oil is in the compressor. You kind of got to take some educated guesses. You could do current draw tests. You could look at it with a thermal imager but you really have to have something to compare it to. So a good working compressor, hit it with a thermal imager, make sure all the things are the same and the bad, you know, or the compressor that's suspect and compare. I mean, there's really no great way to tell if a system has the proper amount of oil charge in it. Um, but if it has a sight glass, sure. When it has a leak, you know, you can look at the sight glass, you can see the operating oil levels too low, you can add oil. But oftentimes when you're dealing with compressors that don't have sight glasses, it's really just an educated guess whether or not to add oil to the system. If I see a huge amount of oil on the bottom of the condensing unit, then yeah, sure, I'm gonna add some oil to that thing. Theoretically, you could unsweat the compressor, pour the oil out, measure it, and then add the right amount for that. I mean, that's a way to go about it. Um, oh, okay, sorry. It's a pre-test HVAC, Grandpa's saying. Yeah, that's a good idea. Still need five years in the trade and a C20 or C38 to sign up. Yeah, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, you are correct. I realize you're answering someone else's question too. So how does wind blow sand into and gum up the Grasland defrost clocks? Uh, sand is just airborne. When it when it goes to the desert environments, just because what you think is sand, the sand you find at the, the beach, there's actually really microscopic sand that's blowing around in the air. It's just dust. And eventually it just gets into weird spots and it just gums stuff up like the grassland defrost clocks. Um, just something we notice out in the desert. So, uh, but if I took that grassland defrost clock and I changed it and I tapped it, you would see the sand just fall out. And it's really fine, minute sand, but it just gums everything up in there. Um, let me see what else. Um, can you get a shop, office tour, and van tour, uh, master of everything? Yeah, I have a couple van tours of my last two vans actually on my YouTube channel. If you just look up van tour. Uh, my new van that I've been in for about 
five months now. I haven't done a van tour on it yet just because I'm not super stoked with the inside of it, but I'll do it one of these days. As far as the shop tour, I'm not going to do a shop tour. I don't really have anything of a presentable shop. I've shown the back of my shop a few times, but we're nothing fancy on that one. Office tour, I've done that on my live streams as far as this office right here. Um, I've done that many times, uh, but I can pop up a clip next time I'm doing a live stream or something like that. Uh, oh, thank you very much, Willie Bryant. Thanks, bud. Really appreciate it. All right. Uh, can you work legally on your apartment unit? You don't live in a house. Uh, Mr. Psycho, no, because your apartment unit is owned by the apartment complex and they're not going to give you permission to work on it. So no. Um, have you ever, have I ever had to change an evaporator coil because the VAP is oil locked and couldn't be rectified? Adam Neal. Uh, yes. And I actually still, the, the one that I had an oil logged evaporator that I had a video on like a month and a half ago, I still haven't changed that thing. The customer, we went into this COVID thing and they, they're just dealing with it. So I'm sure I'll get the call on that too. So I have a system out there that has an oil logged evaporator, or I think it's oil logged. It has some sort of a restriction in it. Um, but yeah, I've changed them before. Um, but most of the time, an oil log evaporator is a hard thing to prove. That is a really hard thing because it's like, okay, this hasn't worked. This hasn't worked. It's really hard to like test to know 100% that it's actually oil logged or not just some sort of a restriction in there. Um, will I do more videos on duct detectors? Cash Monroe. Uh, it's possible. I mean, I have quite a few videos, I think, that pretty much cover duct detectors in depth. I don't do like recommendations on my videos. I mean, when I get a service call on something and I have the opportunity to film it, then I just do it. Um, you know, so, all right. Uh, all right. Let me get to my list of things here. Um, measure quick. So I had a question about measure quick and, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I'm going to be releasing a video soon. On my tools channel, HVACR Tools, there's a show show link in here. I know I keep saying I'm going to release videos. I'm just trying to get a backlog of videos so I can release a couple at a time. But um, I'm going to do a video soon, just a real short one, talking about Measure Quick. But the gist of it, would I recommend someone using Measure Quick or the Field Piece app or the iManifold app, any kind of diagnostic app for a new technician? The answer is yes, but with a caveat. Smart probes, the field piece job link probes, the Sporlin Smart Pro R tools, the Testo probes, all those different ones are only as good as the person using them, okay? Just because I'm using a diagnostic app doesn't mean that everything is going to be correct, okay? You have to know how to interpret the data and how to know when something is incorrect. In my very most recent video, uh, the walk-in cooler video, uh, I showed that, hey, my target suction pressure on my gauges was really low and I wasn't there. And I was like, something's wrong is because I inputted incorrect information into the measure quick app and it set my target too low. So you have to know when to interpret the data and know something, you know, when there's, there's incorrect information either being inputted or measured into the system. So yes, I recommend any of those diagnostic apps just because they put all the information at your fingertips, but you still have to know how to work on the equipment. Um, how many guys do I have working for me and how did I recruit them? Tybor Donka, I don't know how you pronounce your name. Um, currently, I have three employees besides myself. So we have four trucks out there moving. And uh, I mean, I don't remember exactly how I recruited every single one of them. Some of them might have been references. Some of them I might have put job finding websites out or, you know, job finding ads out. Um, it, it, it's, there's been a bunch of different ways that I've recruited people coming to work for me. So. Um, have I ever worked on a multi-compressor rack that share common suction and discharge lines? Yes, I have um, just one of them, though. That is not something that I am very familiar with, but I have worked on a parallel system that had two compressors. It was a walk-in. Well, actually, it was a, it was a very supermarket-style system. It was two tandem compressors. Uh, they had a slave and a master that would rotate every single week. Uh, it had hot gas bypass, so that way one compressor would never shut off to, to keep the inrush current down, and it would run 24-7, and the second compressor would stage on suction pressure. And then it had a time clock in it that would switch the slave and the master compressor, so that way we would get equal run time. So every seven days, the, the, the primary compressor would change to the other compressor, and then the other compressor would become the secondary compressor. Um, so yes, I have worked on them. I'm not very familiar with them. I understand the general concepts of how they work, okay? Uh, they had an oil management system on them. 
Um, you know, you got to be careful about that stuff. But no, I'm not very comfortable. I really wouldn't want to go any further than what I've already explained about it. Um, let me see what else. Um, all right, I'm going to get to my list of stuff to talk about. I uh, already covered that. Um, oh, great question. Jake had pointed something out, and I get this quite often, and I wanted to address it. Jake pointed out that, you know, first off, he complimented my filming, which I thank you, Jake, but I'm not very good at filming. I know I, I just do kind of very low production on my videos. But he said, you know, he goes, I would, he was telling me, I would do so much better if I used like a GoPro mount on my chest or on my head or some sort of a camera mount to where I didn't have to hold them because he noticed that I film all the time with one hand, right? And there is truth in that, but here's the reason why I don't use a GoPro and here's the reason why I don't do multiple um, uh, or, or have like a mount on my chest or something is because I get motion sickness. And when I'm editing a video, if I have to watch that camera moving all around and all around and walking with me, it's going to make me get sick while I'm editing the video. Okay. So uh, I like to film with just my phone too, because it's simple. I carry it on me and it's one less thing I have to carry. I have GoPros and different things and I filmed a few times with them, but they're just a pain in the butt to use. I do carry a tripod with me occasionally. You've probably seen it actually. It's sitting right back here. It's a little portable tripod. I will set that up and talk to the camera sometimes every once in a while. But for the most part, I just film with my hand, and that's the reason why. Um, let me see. Great question I had right here. This is a really important question. Someone had asked me, is clearing a sight glass enough on a residential system? So they mean when charging a system, can you just clear the sight glass on the residential system? Okay, so first off, I talk about charging refrigeration systems by clearing sight glasses all the time. Something to understand. A sight glass is a window into the system wherever it's located at that certain point in the system. Okay, in a perfect world, you want your sight glass on a refrigeration system with an expansion valve and a receiver. You want your sight glass as close to the metering device as possible. The purpose of the main purpose of a sight glass is to make sure that we can see that we have a solid column of liquid going to the expansion valve. Okay, the expansion valve operates by changing the state of liquid refrigerant to a vapor liquid mixture. But an expansion valve does not work correctly when it does not have liquid refrigerant going to it. The same theory goes for a residential system too, but there's a problem, okay? An expansion valve in a residential system needs liquid refrigerant going to it for it to work right. But on residential systems, all right, you don't just clear a sight glass. On residential systems with an expansion valve, you charge to subcooling, okay? Subcooling oftentimes will be changed depending on you know the manufacturer, but a rule of thumb is you're going to run about 10 degrees subcooling, but sometimes that can change. Lean on the manufacturer depending on the efficiency of the equipment, okay? So a sight glass on a residential system is not a bad idea, but the only thing that a sight glass would do is tell you when you have a gross undercharge, meaning way undercharged, okay? Because if you do some experiments, if you put a sight glass on a residential system, what you will notice is that when you're charging it, You'll notice that the sight glass will clear up, but you still don't have your subcooling, your required subcooling numbers. And you oftentimes will have to add another pound or two to the system to get your subcooling up to what the manufacturer recommends to get the proper system efficiency, okay? So with that being said, if you had a sight glass on there, if that sight glass started flashing, you don't just clear the sight glass, okay? What I would suggest is, is you pay attention to the subcooling, you clear the sight glass, and then add refrigerant to get the subcooling up to the proper levels. That would go for commercial air conditioning too, if you have a sight glass, or I mean, if you have an expansion valve. But can you clear a sight glass and know that the system is charged correctly on a residential system? No, okay? Can you clear a sight glass and know that a system is charged correctly on a refrigeration walk-in cooler? Not necessarily. I'm not just going to clear a sight glass. I'm still going to have my gauges on there. I'm going to look at the numbers. I'm going to pay attention to the vitals. So a sight glass is just a, a starting point to give me an idea if we have somewhat close to the correct charge on a refrigeration system, but it does not mean that it's properly charged. Understanding something too, most of the time, even though the best place for a sight glass on a refrigeration system is close to the expansion valve as possible, most of the time they're installed the furthest point away from the expansion valve. So theoretically, you could have some sort of a pressure drop in between the sight glass on the roof and the expansion valve that could be causing some sort of an issue, okay? So you have to know how to interpret that data. Um, someone had asked me 
about going back to work for a company that he had already put his notice in for. So he was working for a company a while back. He put in his notice. They let him go right away, which is fine. That's the company's, you know, they can choose to do that or not. They didn't let him finish out his two weeks. And here it's been a while now, and they're coming back to him saying, hey, we really want you to come back to work for us. You know, we'll give you a raise. I think he said like five bucks or something like that an hour. And we want you to come back and train other technicians. And he was asking me my opinion. First off, you have to do what's best for you and your family. But I told him, my advice to him was trust your gut. I said, if you left that company for a justifiable reason, $5 an hour might not be the smartest decision for you to go back to them. Because if you chose to leave before you were making that $5 an hour, maybe, you know, and he has to know why he left, but I'm assuming he left for a good reason. Going back for money is not necessarily going to be the best choice, but I'm not the person to make the decision for him. And I just told him to trust his gut. And I think that's an important thing to tell everybody. So, um, let me see what I'm missing in here. Does a refrigeration system have an average subcooling? Steve, so a refrigeration system is very difficult to know where to measure subcooling because we have a storage, a liquid storage device coming out of the condenser called a receiver. With that storage device, the subcooling is totally skewed. So yes, there's some trends that I tar start to notice in my head. Um, we usually don't measure subcooling, uh, but when, when we do, if I have a system that is grossly overcharged, if you take a measurement of subcooling, you're obviously going to have a really high subcooling. So subcooling still does have an effect. It is still subcooling the refrigerant and the condenser and changing the state, but we're not necessarily charging to 10 degrees subcooling. But on average, if I don't see about three degrees subcooling coming out of a condenser, most of the time there's something going on there and your sight glass will usually reflect um, you know, flashing sight glass, if that's the case. So uh, just, just something that I happen to notice somewhere between two to three degrees subcooling is what I tend to measure coming out of the condenser when I have a clear sight glass. So, but it changes every time. Um, yeah, exactly. I'm saying you got a gut there. Uh, how long does a liquid line filter last? It lasts as long as the system stays dry. A liquid line filter dryer is there to uh, filter the system out. If you have moisture in the system, then a filter dryer is going to plug up faster. Of course, a filter dryer can rot out too if it's left out in the elements, salty environments and things like that. But, but if it's just a standard operating filter dryer, it's going to last forever really or until the system gets contaminated with moisture or some sort of other contaminants. But if you have a perfectly operating system with no contaminants, there's no reason to change the filter dryer unless some catastrophic failure happened in the dryer or something like that. Am I hiring once this COVID thing is over? If yes, you're available Saturdays and Sundays, Miguel. Um, I mean, I would be considering, you know, yeah, sure. Always looking for, I'm definitely looking for an experienced service technician because I need some, some serious help, but yeah, I would be considering training people too, but Saturdays and Sundays wouldn't work for me because I don't like to work on Saturdays and Sundays. You know, we're overtime on Saturdays and Sundays. It's a whole thing. So it would have to be full-time employees, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, all right, gentlemen. Uh, oh, John Deere fan, you asked if there's a difference between Cold Zone and Russell. They're the same company. Cold Zone and Russell are the same company. They just different brands. One of them bought one of them many years ago and they merged their companies, but they're the same thing. Um, yeah, hit the thumbs up button, guys. It definitely, definitely helps out the stream. Okay. Really, really appreciate it. Um, let's say, uh, I think that's pretty much it I got on my list. So I'm going to cover some more questions you guys have in there and I'll definitely try to answer them. Okay. Um, drink. I'm drinking water. Did I scratch my nose? Is that what you're supposed to drink? Yeah, you guys, we got a lot of people watching the the stream. If you guys could just simply hit the thumbs up button, it definitely helps to support the channel for sure. So, um, all right. Well, gentlemen, ladies, I'm assuming there might be a few ladies watching this. I'm going to transition out of here. For those of you that have never been here, see you later. For those of you that come here often, see you in a few.
yo, I could still do this, just not drinking another beer. Maybe I'll drink another water. There we go. It's all right, though. It's my sparkling water, so it's fancy water. Oh, man. Hopefully, you guys had a good week this week. It was good. Uh, the week, you know, I had an excellent weekend. Absolutely amazing weekend. Uh, oh, thanks for so much for that super chat, man. 98 DeVille. That's awesome, bud. That's that's really cool. Yeah, but I had an awesome weekend. Uh, this was the first time we went with some family or family friends, I should say. They met us in our local mountains. We did like a, you know, social distancing kind of a hangout. We just went to the local community park, regional park, walked around the lake, ate dinner in a picnic table, you know, that kind of stuff. And it was just nice. Just we actually Saturday and Sunday, we drove up to our local mountains. It's about an hour from my house each day and just basically spent the day up there just hiking around, relaxing, you know, enjoying, letting my kids play outside. They, It's nice, you know, um, watching them play and have fun. And it's just a super nice day walking around dreaming of houses we'll never be able to live in. We're driving around a fancy lake community that's up by us called Lake Arrowhead. Stuff that we would never be able to uh, uh, afford, you know. So it's just kind of nice to have those kind of dreams every once in a while to see a $10 million home, you know, with a lake house and – you know, boat docks and fancy hundred thousand dollar boats sitting in the the water, and you know, but it was just cool just to be able to chill and get out. And it really, uh, you know, I'm an outdoors person, and I really, really enjoy being outside. And it just, it's, it's all reminding me. It's like begging me to come back. It's been so long since I've gone backpacking or camping or all that stuff, and I need to get back to it because uh, it's, it's just like calling me back. When I went up there, it's like, man, I just want I yesterday my wife and I and my kids just went up there without our friends and we just went back up there and kind of went to the same places and I took my slack line it's like a tightrope that you set up and set it up between two trees and I was doing the slack line and my daughters I took a hammock and I, I just wanted to be outside you know just somewhere besides my house and it was just super nice to do that and really makes me want to go back I kind of want to go back there today just to watch the sunset again from the mountains and you know uh, as we were driving up there, exploring roads that I've always driven by, but always been in a hurry, never wanted to. Thanks again, Marcus. And that's an awesome super chat, bud. That was really cool. But yeah, it's super nice just to get out and, you know, enjoy something. I enjoy being out outdoors kind of stuff. So really, really cool. Uh, how do I go about setting up a low pressure control cut in and differential, uh, giant. So I, this is like the point of the stream where I really don't cover the technical stuff, but send me an email and I'll try to answer that one. I actually have some videos on that, but send me an email to HVACRvideos at gmail.com. If you guys have any technical questions, send them to that. This part, I just kind of BS and talk about whatever. Um, let me see what else we got. Uh, anything else coming up? Um, answered that. Yeah. LM Sylvia. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name. I'm hoping that's correct. Uh, you said you had a dead week. I mean, it's still kind of, yeah, it's, it's scary for sure. We're slow. I had an overtime call this weekend that I had to go out on, on an AC. It's like a, for another restaurant, you know, so that was interesting. And I had to follow up on it today and, um, but yeah, not a lot of work, but I definitely enough. We brought our guys back. So it's, it's been picking up a little bit slowly. So let's, let's hope it keeps going. You know, I want some more work. I, I like to fix things. So, um, let me see. What else we got going on in here? Yeah, hit the thumbs up button for sure. It definitely is free, and it's a way to support me for sure. Definitely helps. So, um, cool. Yeah, and that's the other thing too, you guys. Definitely check. It's popping up right now in the stream. Definitely check out the overtime channel. Um, I'll be on there this Friday, work permitting. Uh, we had a good time last week. Uh, like I had said, I definitely drank too much, and I wasn't too happy with not being able to remember most of it. But um, it was a good show. You know, and I'm going to try to chill out a little bit with that because I feel like it's just I used to not drink very much at all. And ever since this virus thing, it seems like every weekend and every live stream and it's just it's a bit much for me. So I've been trying to tone it down. That's that's the plan, at least. But I may change my mind next Friday. Who knows? Um, hey, maybe if I just limit one live stream a week to drinking, maybe I'll do that. You know, maybe start with baby steps. Uh, yeah, Fluke 196, the shirts are going to be coming. So I said it in the beginning of the stream. Um, I ordered a huge order of shirts and hats. It, for me, huge, it cost me thousands of dollars. Um, but, uh, I think there was 200 something shirts or I don't know, stupid amount of shirts, whatever it is. I think it was like 200 and 288 shirts, I think, or something like that. And like 48 hats or something. That's huge for me because it cost me a stupid amount of money. 
to be able to order them with my design and everything on them. So um, I will be setting up a website. Um, I'm just setting up all the licensing crap and sales tax permits and everything to be able to legit sell them and things. So yes, I will. As far as international, I haven't figured that part out yet. We'll have to figure something out with the international stuff, but within the States for sure, legit sales tax, all that crap and being able to do things legally will be coming soon. It'll be on my website, which I have not made public to anybody yet, but I will make it public soon and let everybody know. And don't worry if the shirts sell out, I plan on ordering more. I just, it was, it was a little scary to make a multiple thousand dollar purchase on t-shirts. Um, if they sell out, then I'll order more and it's no big deal. It's not going to take that long to order them once I get going on the whole process. So I will have, I do have some of the multiple sizes. I'd say that as far as the sizes go, I, same colors, white, dark gray, and black, uh, definitely plenty of large, extra large, double XL. Um, then after the double XL, the 3XL, the 4XL, I didn't order as many of, but if I see the sales go, then I will definitely order more of those too. But definitely have plenty of the uh, XL, the large XL, double XL for sure have plenty. So um, that'll be coming soon. Um, let's see what else. Uh, what is, uh, are you asking me what my dream car is? If I want, uh, oh yeah, you can find me on Google there. It's just, it's not set up. It just says maintenance mode, I think, doesn't it, Ike? Um, as far as uh, as far as um, a dream car, if you're asking me, I think that VW microbus right there would be probably one of my dream cars. If I could have a VW bus, that would be an awesome car, for sure. One of these days. Uh, what mountains I have I always like to go to. So what mountains have I always liked to go to? Oh, uh, my local mountain range, San Bernardino Mountain Range, San Bernardino National Forest. So uh, this weekend we were up in Crestline Lake Gregory. Um, and then Lake Arrowhead is where we were hanging out with. Um, but, uh, we also have the Angeles national forest. Those are just our local ones. Of course, those are like fake mountain ranges cause they're more desert E mountain ranges. If I could get up into the Sierras, my, my, I said this, I think on my last live stream, but one of my dreams in life, and it probably won't happen. I know it won't happen for years if it ever does is to be able to hike the Pacific crest trail in one hike, not stopping, not doing it in sections. So from Mexico to Canada, I would like to hike the Pacific Crest Trail, and then I would also like to hike the Appalachian Trail. Um, I'm into the camping, outdoors stuff, backpacking. I'm totally into that. So that's a dream of mine to be able to do that for sure. Kind of wish I would have done it as a kid uh, before I got responsibilities and all that stuff. Not that I would ever want to change any of my responsibilities, my family, my kids, but it's just one of those things where I kind of wish I would have already hiked that, the Pacific Crest Trail at least, but... If you haven't done something like that and you have the ability, I highly suggest you do so you don't have like regret and want to go do it as you get older. Um, let's see. Um, uh, solve this channel. Send me an email, hvacrvideos at gmail.com. Um, yeah, I believe I did send Isaiah a shirt last time. Uh, I gave shirts away, Ted. A lot of people don't know this because I didn't make it completely public, but I've given shirts away before. I've never sold them, but I did them on like a donation, kind of like I'll send them to you for free thing. Uh, this time the order's a little bit too big to do that, but I did give shirts away and I've sent Isaiah shirts. So some people, a lucky 144 of you guys that used to watch the stream like a year and a half ago, saw a live stream where I gave away 144 shirts basically. So um, let's see. Uh, I would love to have a VW van for sure. Um, all right, guys. For real, though, uh, I do need to eat dinner. Someone had asked what's for dinner tonight. I think we're just doing like we, we need to go to the grocery store. So I think we're just doing soup or something like that. We got a bunch of canned foods and different things that I think we're going to try to tackle. Um, but, yeah, nothing nothing special for dinner tonight. So really, really appreciate you guys making it to the end of this. Uh, you guys are awesome. I'm going to cue up the real outro music, and uh, we'll see you guys on Friday night on the HVAC Overtime Show, okay? <laughs>